It's the most wonderful time of the year, isn't it? With kids jingle belling and everyone telling you be of good cheer. With those holiday greetings and gay happy meetings with friends come to call. There'll be parties for hosting, marshmallows for roasting, and caroling out in the snow. And there'll be mistletoeing and hearts will be glowing when loved ones are near because it's the most wonderful time of the year, right? For some of us. Uh, others find this time of the year expensive, <laughs> demanding, stressful, exhausting, full of family conflict. Now, some people just find it lonely. Whether it's your favorite time of the year or a time when you just try to survive. Do you perceive the presence and work of God in the midst of it? That's a problem that people have had with Christmas from the very beginning. Uh, the first Christmas was wondrous. It was full of the presence of God and his word, both scriptural, uh, both scriptural prophecy and by messages delivered by angels. I was attended by miracles, so it was kind of awesome. Uh, it was also disruptive, inconvenient, and delivered a significant dose of family rejection, shame, and mystery. I'm going to read the Christmas story for you from Luke 2. I believe we have slides for this. Here we go. Ooh, fancy. Oh, well, sorry, I have the wrong version here. I've got the, well, let me read it off the, off the screen. We'll go that way. So in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. They were required to do that. Um, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Uh, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, like a feeding trough, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were, I'm gonna, I was going to say, they were sore afraid. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. It's an interesting sign, right? To, to see the sign, they actually have to go. Uh, suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying, God, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which they which were just as they had been told. 
So that first Christmas, like I said, kind of awesome, attended by angelic visitations and you know, light and, and music, um, but also uh, full of disruption and difficulty. For Mary and Joseph, the process had already been unconventional uh, and fraught with trouble. So she was pregnant out of wedlock in a culture where that could not only end your marriage, you know, she's sort of halfway married, right? Uh, their, their period of betrothal was like one year of being married but not yet consummating the marriage. And it could have ended her marriage, but it also could potentially have ended her life, uh, at least scripturally, right? Le Leviticus 20, verse 12, and Deuteronomy 20, 22 and following say that you, you, you stone somebody uh, who's, uh, who's had sex outside of their marriage. And Joseph's intent was to, to put Mary away quietly uh, so as not to expose her to even more public shame. There's no avoiding that there's going to be a baby, but, you know, he didn't have to make a, a huge deal about it. Instead, as we, as we heard last week, uh, God gives him a dream and tells him to take Mary as his wife. And so he does. And when he does that, he takes on all of the shame, all of the innuendo. Uh, what should have been a happy occasion ends up becoming kind of a, kind of a prickly one, right? I mean, it's, it's joyful to be uh, starting a life with someone, and it wasn't the best of circumstances. Uh, the census meant that they had to travel to Bethlehem. And there were no trains or cars. And Mary was very pregnant, right? Right about to pop. This had to feel like the worst possible time. And being in Bethlehem was frustrating because it says that there was no room for them. Now, I don't know if you thought about what that must have meant, right? They're going back to Bethlehem because it's where, de, uh, it's where Joseph's family is. Uh, his, his, his relatives live there, and there's no room for them. What does that mean? You know, was it that, you know, there were so many people visiting from out of town that uh, there, there just wasn't a space for the pregnant lady? Is it that the family didn't quite approve? And so there's no spot for you here. And Jesus had to be born around animals. I've heard commentators try to, try to uh, soften this a little bit. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't like a really cold stable out far from everything. It was a room inside the house where the animals were. And I think, okay, you're not making me happy. You know, Ellie just had a baby, yay. <laughs> you know, would she want to have her baby in a room in the house where all the animals stay, you know? Probably not. She's hardy, but. And speaking of Jesus, it seems like there would have been way more favorable places and circumstances into which he could have come, right? If, if God's going to become a human being, he could, he could come as a prince and, and, and be born in a palace, or maybe not be born at all, just show up as an adult. He could have... He could have been born to politically well-connected parents who didn't have to flee to keep him from being murdered. 
Even the shepherds who get this amazing light and sound show get disrupted at their work, right? So it's not just, oh, there's this happy message from heaven. The message says, go to Bethlehem. You'll see a baby lying in a manger, and they have to leave work to go check it out. And Mary and Joseph are interrupted again by the shepherds, possibly in the middle of the night, I don't know. But, you know, they always make it, if you, if you look at the nativity sets and stuff, it looks like a happy occasion, right? All these people showing up to honor Jesus and the, the, the happy, tired, but proud parents just welcoming them. It's like, if it was the middle of the night, you just got the baby down, and then these guys show up at your door, and you don't know who they are, and they're like, yeah, we've... We came to see the baby. We celebrate Christmas because when Jesus was born, God entered the world from the inside as one of us. He lived our life. He suffered our sufferings. He eventually died our death that we could be forgiven and reconciled to him forever and so that, so that everything could be made new. But on that day, none of that had happened. All they have is the disruption, the inconvenience, the rejection and shame, and soon, the danger. And they have mystery, a lot of, a lot of wondrous unknowns. According to the scriptures, everything has changed. The whole world is being made new. But does it seem like it? How do Mary and Joseph and the shepherds have eyes to see more than trouble or some weird spiritual experience? I think the bottom line is it's not because they're smart or clever. It's not because they're trying really hard. It's not even because they really, really want to know. Um, they're getting help. Uh, they're, they're getting revelation from God, both from the scriptures and from these angelic visits that help them to understand what's going on because their circumstances don't look like what is actually happening. And it takes faith to see what God is doing and to trust that what he said, both in his word and to them directly, is somehow true, even though the circumstances don't say that at all. I think the same thing is true for us this Christmas. I don't know if for you this is the most wonderful time of the year. You know, you like to drive around and look at all the lights or decorate your house or, you know, you've got tons of gifts under your tree. We, we don't have a tree. Uh, we, we don't operate that way. This tree is the church's tree not our tree. So, um, yeah, we, we, we don't operate that way. But it, it, it takes faith to believe that what God says is true. This Christmas, will you see with the eyes of faith that God really is making all things new, that he really is pouring out blessing, not as a separate thing from himself, but by coming on the inside. The end of a message is often the time when I'll call you to action, uh, to obey God in forgiving or being generous or serving or seeking him. Today, all I'm asking is that you open yourself to God revealing himself. 
We need that if we're going to see with the eyes of faith, if we're going to experience his presence and perceive what he's doing, even in part. So I'm just going to invite you now to close your eyes and to open your hearts. We're going to take like a minute of silence and uh, allow God to make himself known to us. Lord God, we open ourselves to you as best we know how. We recognize that it's not a matter of IQ or determination or even longing. Uh, It is a matter of your coming and showing yourself to us. And so, Holy Spirit, come and reveal yourself to us. Lord, with all of the things that Christmas entails, with the traditions, with the gifts, with the people, with the obligations, with all of the decorations and the fanfare, uh, we pray, Lord, that in all of that, we would not lose you. That those things would become a window to be able to see you at work in our lives, and in a world that seems like it's spinning out of control. Lord, speak a word of encouragement and reassurance to your people today. In Jesus' name, amen.